إنني روح نبي إنني أم أبي إنني روح نبي هذه صرخة أدمعي تحكي قصة أضلعي هذه صرخة أدمعي تحكي قصة أضلعي إنني In the Umayyad program, this I think is the, uh, this will be the, the, the peak when it comes to challenging narrative and discussion. This is the peak of it all. Yeah? This is effectively the level where we reach a specific point. Perspectives may shift and uh, if you haven't been challenged yet, this will be the time um, where you will be challenged because the topics discussed today will be very sensitive. The Umayyads really enter a phase of darkness that cannot be excused at all. But there are also many other issues, politically speaking, socially speaking, that uh, mark a significant, um, you could say, division amongst the Muslims in the first generation, second generation. Uh, and then, obviously, what follows from there is what we have today. The Sunni Shia split, the different p political outlooks, the different historical records, the different, different perspectives. So it's really a very, very, very critical uh, unit today. So we're going to look at the very, very critical uh, chapter. I call it the silent chapter. The reason why, especially from the Sunni perspective, and I'm a Sunni, this is the chapter that is typically overlooked. When you look at, for example, courses on Islamic history, let's take a 10-week course, let's look at maybe a series of lectures. This chapter is a chapter that is typically the silent chapter. It is just overlooked, maybe skimmed quickly, there's no effort to delve into it critically and objectively from textual basis and critical analysis because it's uncomfortable and in many cases inconvenient. So that's just what we're going to end, embark upon today. And it's very important for us to actually exercise our critical thought in this area as a measure of safety for myself and consideration for you. I have relied extremely heavily upon text this time. I'm going to read it from the screen. I don't want to just recite from my mind. I'm going to read from the screen and give you the screenshots of the books and references. I want you to see it for yourselves. Don't take it from me. Don't take it from me. Challenge me if something sounds odd. I'm not going to take it for granted. But it's important we look at things honestly and openly. For the first time in this series as well, I'm going to bring in Shia sources or Shia authorities for the first time ever. It's important to get that insight as well in perspective. We're going to be talking about very critical and shared history as well. Karbala is a shared history. And a lot has been written about and said about behind closed doors that I think we'd benefit from uh, as a group together. But before we do that, a bit of backstory. Let's build up the storyline. Let's build up. Let's get back to where we can actually understand the story, appreciate for what it is, okay? So a bit of backstory. Let's build up a bit of that narrative. If you remember the scenery where I covered the Umayyad Kingdom, the various cities, the first capital being Medina, second capital being Kufa, third capital being Damascus, so on and so forth, and the reasons for why these capitals kept changing. Okay, We are now at a period in which it is the reign of the young ones. The reign of the young ones. Okay, The 60s. In Islamic history, 
uh, especially in the field of the Tabari and Ibn Kathir, they talk about the 60s and the reign of the youth. The 60s and the reign of the youth. And some Sahaba were known to make dua, Ya Allah, take me before the 60s. Take my life away before I live to see the 60s. What did they mean by this? What they meant was that the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he made a prophecy that there would come a time when the Ummah would be ruled by young men. Okay? Young rulers. And they would wreak havoc. And they would come from us. Mean Jildatina, our skin, us, our speak our language from our tribe. And some Sahaba actually had a bit more knowledge, insight. It would be in the 60th year, sometime in the 60th year. So the 60s was something they made dua against. They didn't want to live to see this. So it so happens that uh, Muawiyah radiallahu anhu dies and Yazid becomes the Khalifa. And he goes about electing other young men and the Ummah is plunged into a darkness like never before. So the, the youth are reigning the Ummah for the first time. And the elderly uh, Sahaba who are still alive are really tested, really tested. They have to pick a side now. Okay. So we're in the 60s and the locus of power and influence has shifted from Medina. It is no longer a Madani-based uh, government. It is now Kufan and also Damascus because it's under the Umayyads. Kufa, however having been recently disinvested of their premier position as the leading city in Islam, are now harboring a lot of resentment, as I explained before. The cost centers, the profit centers, having been removed of that position and all of their wealth from Aswad being taken away from them. So a lot of resentment is building up in Kufa. And several key battles happen in Kufa and Basra. Okay? But the one we want to talk about, and the backstory to this episode is going to be Basra. Basra. A famous battle happens in Basra. Okay. In the time of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu. And this is where everything begins. The domino effect begins from there. Okay. So a quick recap. Uthman radiallahu anhu, the third Khalifa in the line of righteous Khulafa, is assassinated in Medina in his home. When he's assassinated, the next person in line is Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu. He makes an assessment of the situation and he decides it is not prudent to remain in this city where my predecessors were assassinated. I need to move capitals. And also there is an air of unsettlement in Medina because the society is divided into two camps. One camp demands immediate retribution for the murder of uh, Uthman and the other camp wants a bit of, uh, you could say, time to fix the situation. So the atmosphere and those who killed Uthman are still on the loose, effectively. So he decides to move capitals to Kufa. That causes even more problems. Okay. So we are now, I'm going to recite, because I don't want to say this from my own. These tapes are very heavy. I don't want to say it from my own, my own tongue. I'm going to recite from At-Tabari, which is the authoritative text when it comes to Islamic history, when you want to learn Islamic history from a Sunni and Shia perspective, At-Tabari is the epitome of historiography. There's nothing better than him in terms of context, content, uh, what he produces in terms of the evidences, the citations. He really exhausts all the various sources of information and combines it for you. So this is the book you want to look into for anything to do with classical Islamic history. There's no other source, not Ibn Kathir, not Ibn Athir, this is the book, okay? And in fact, all the other books take from him. So this is the most accomplished, most comprehensive source of information, primary source of information. So this is where everything begins. According to Ali ibn Ahmad ibn Hassan al-Ajli, who is writing, al Hussein ibn Nasir al-Attar and his father, let's keep going, until he gets to the point where Aisha, radiallahu anha, arrived at Sarif on her way back home from visiting Mecca. So the event, the assassination of Uthman, happened while Aisha, radiallahu anha, who was a leading figure in, in Medina. She was a leading scholar and authority. The Khulafa who came before Uthman, including Uthman, used to go to her for advice and counseling, including her own father, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. So she was 
a chief primary source of guidance and also consultation for the rulers at the time. So anything that happened in Medina, Aisha had to be in the know. She had to be in the know. Okay? So Aisha arrived at Sarif on her way back from visiting Mecca. So on her way back from Mecca, maybe performing Hajj, maybe performing Umrah, Ubaid ibn Umm Kilab met her. He was Ubaid, let's not get into that, and his mother, so on and so forth. Aisha asked him, uh, they killed Uthman and then did nothing for eight nights. What is the matter? So Aisha asked him, what's the matter? Uh, he says, they killed Uthman and for eight nights, nothing was done. No retribution, no one's arrested, nobody's executed, no one's questioned for eight nights. So Uthman, the, khil- the Khalifa al Mu'mineen, is killed in his home in Medina. And for eight nights, nothing happens. So Aisha requests, she says, what did they do to them? So she, what happened? So if nothing happened, exactly what's happening, this, what's happening in Medina? So the people of Medina handled the affair by consensus, ijma' and matters proceeded very well for them. They agreed upon Ali ibn Abi Talib to be the next Khalifa. This is what he tells her. Nothing happened to the murderers. They are still on the loose. But the people of Medina decided to elect Ali ibn Abi Talib as the next man in succession, as the next Khalifa. So Aisha responds, Wallahi, would that the sky have overturned if the command is decided in favor of your leader. Take me back, take me back. So she makes a huge statement here. Okay? That the decision taken now by Sayyidina Ali is such a huge decision. Well that the sky were overturned, okay? To do nothing about the killing of Uthman? It's not a small thing for her. So she's going back to confront and face a situation. By Allah, Uthman has been killed unjustly. By Allah, Uthman has been killed unjustly and I will seek revenge for his blood. Now this is why it's important to read the text because oftentimes when you go to certain sources they'll tell you, no, 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 it's just misunderstanding. There was never an intent to confront Ali. It was just she wanted to ask a few questions. The statements are very clear, black and white. She wanted to seek revenge for the blood spilt in Medina. And she was not happy with the decision taken by the new leader, Sayyidina Ali. Okay, it's not my words. It's in the text. And she's senior enough to have that authority to counter the word of Ali. Anhu. She's senior enough to have that authority to counter. And so now the level is raised. Okay, The level is raised. So we have a position in Medina. And coming out of Mecca, we have a position which says, no, we will certainly seek revenge on behalf of Uthman. So that's the first statement, keep in mind. Now let's look at what happens in the, th- in the year, same year in Basra. Okay? The Battle of Basra, also known as the Battle of the Camel. It's the same battle, the Battle of Basra, the Battle of the Camel. Uh, and this happens shortly thereafter. So we have two forces that confront one another. You have the government of Sayyidina Ali, radiallahu anhu, who by and large, the people of Medina, the senior scholars of Medina, have followed his position. Let us not pursue the, the assailants now. Let's wait for a certain time for things to settle in, Med- in Medina, in the Ummah. Then we will set trial and find those co- uh, culprits responsible. Those in that school were certainly Sayyidina Ali, radiallahu anhu, his sons, al Hassan, and this is very important. This is so, you know, this, this part of the story is, is undercooked in many narratives. Look at who was in, on either camp of the conflict in, in this year. Ali and both his, both his sons, both his sons, Abdullah ibn Abbas and other companions, Ibn Umar, so on and so forth. But these are the key people. And the cities that support are in support of his policy and in support of his leadership Kufa and Basra. And the clan in particular, Banu Hashim. Yeah. All of this is very important information here. On the other side, the contestants, the leading figurehead is Sadatna Aisha, radiallahu anha. 
supported by two very influential men, Talha ibn Abaydillah, Az Zubair ibn al Awam, and his son. Now, this is very interesting. Az Zubair has many sons. His eldest son, Abdullah ibn Zubair, accompanies him to the battle. Keep this in mind. Keep all of this information in mind. Ali radiallahu anhu goes to battle, accompanied by his two sons, Al Hassan and Al Hussein. Aisha bint Abi Bakr goes to battle with her brother in law, Az Zubair, and her nephew, Abdullah ibn Zubair. Very key. And the cities that support this faction, Mecca, certainly, but also Damascus, but they're more docile. They don't participate directly, but they're watching from the outskirts. Yeah? Damascus. And the main tribe, you could say, that is behind this or supporting this, Banu Abdul Shams. Certainly, why? Because it's their kinsman who was killed. So the Umayyads were on this side. It's a proto-war, effectively, between the Umayyads. It begins there. Because Banu, Abba, Banu uh, Abbas, the Abbasids were on the side of Sayyidina Ali. Banu Umayyah were on the side of Sayyidina Aisha. So it was a conflict of these two would-be empires at that battle of uh, Basra. It began there. But there were other conflicts as well. If you look at the names listed on the other side, there were other future conflicts present there on that day. So the battle happens. We know the outcome, we're not going to focus on the battle today. It's not part of this unit, but it's good for the background context. This is exactly what the sides look like, the key cities involved, and the key clans involved. It's all in the Tabari in great detail, by the way. Yeah. Now, looking at Az Zubair ibn al Awam is very important because if you look on the side of Sayyidatna Aisha, she didn't have any children of her own. She has no children. Okay, she didn't have any children. And she was the mother of the believers. So there was only a certain level that you could say her authority would go when it comes to battle and political maneuvers. And she had no legacy beyond herself. In fact, she wouldn't have a child who would inherit from her later on. What she did have was a nephew. We want to get to the psyche of Abdullah ibn Zubair. Because when we talk about Ibn Zubair, oftentimes it's like a passing reference. Oh, Zubair took over, he fought against, and he he's a key proponent. He's a very strong candidate on many counts. But to understand and to appreciate that, let's look at the connections he has to Aisha, Az Zubair, and all the other companions. You find here that his father, Az Zubair, was married to the daughter of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, Asma. Asma was the wife of Az Zubair, and together they had children, uh, one of those children being Abdullah ibn Zubair. Okay? Abdullah ibn Zubair was a son of Az Zubair, one of the ten companions, and the son of Asma, the sister of Aisha. Anha. He was also a descendant directly of Khadija. Khadija, the wife of Sayyidina Muhammad sallam, al Kubra was the aunt of Az Zubair. So the great aunt of Abdullah ibn Zubair. Look at the pedigree, look at the lineage he has. Ibn Zubair, right? Look at the lineage. And his uh, great-grandfather, Khawalid, was a brother of Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib. So the wife of uh, Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib. So his lineage is really top-tier lineage, right? He's connected, well-connected. Then we have the fact that... Uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair was the first boy from the, Ansar, from the Muhajirin to be born in Medina. He was the first male child born in Medina. There was a time when the uh, Jews in Medina would say that the Muslims were cursed and they would not have a male child or they would not have male children born of them. It was a curse that they had put on the Muslim community in Medina and some Muslims believed it. We've been cursed, we don't have any, so our effective, our lineage will end here. So when Abdullah ibn Zubair and Asma conceived and the child came, it was a boy, Abdullah ibn Zubair, two years after Hijrah, two years after Hijrah, it was a massive celebration in Medina. Massive celebration. Yes, certainly there was no curse and we do have male children. And this child was taken to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi who named him and made tahniq for him. The first boy born in Medina of the Muhajirin. He was named 
and uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam technique. So he's not just an ordinary person. That's what I'm trying to get to here. His grandfather is none other than Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, the first Khalifa. The first Khalifa was his grandfather. Okay. And his mother, of course, was the daughter of Sayyidina Abu Bakr. His aunt, his direct aunt, was Aisha, the beloved wife of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who herself didn't have children. So she took her, sis her sister's children as her, effectively, you know, you have an aunt who treats you like a child, effectively. That was Abdullah ibn Zubair and Urwa ibn Zubair and Mus'ab with Aisha. But more particular Urwa and Abdullah. So they were effectively her children, quote-unquote. She adopted them as their children. Very close relationships. And so it makes sense why he would accompany his aunt to the battlefield. It makes sense. It's not just haphazard. He's going with his father and his aunt to the battlefield. And he's a key proponent. Well, that's why we see later on. Why is it that when al Hussein is resisting or he's standing up or he's making an effort to counter the Umayyad hegemony, Abdullah ibn Zubair is also there next to him. What qualifies him for that? All of this qualifies him for that. Had it not been for, Abdul, had it not been for uh, al Hassan and al Hussein and their position, rank, Abdullah ibn Zubair would be an obvious choice for many reasons. An obvious choice for many reasons. Okay? But in the battle of the camel, he is on opposite sides to al Hussein, And this dynamic is very important. It's so important. In the battle of the camel, they are on opposite sides. Each one of them with their father. Each one of them with their father. Fighting one another. Very important for later on, the, the narrative that unfolds later on. Okay. So, let's go back to the 12 men of Medina, the key people in Medina. You remember the names, which the position each person took. We all remember these things. Two members are now, they were together against Yazid. But when Uthman is killed, they are no longer together because of the circumstances. al Hussein ibn Ali is going to be, of course, supporting his father. And Abdullah ibn Zubair is also going to be supporting his father. So this unity is now divided amongst the men of Medina. Who's the third man of Medina who's also implicated in this drama that's going to unfold in the next 10 years, sitting in this table? Who's the third man? We have al Hussein, who represents uh, Ali radiallahu anhu as Zubair. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Yes, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Yes. Yes. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. It's, subhanallah. You know, this time when they were together against Yazid, all three men were on the same accord. Abdul Malik would defend the honor of Abdullah ibn Zubair for years to come. But how things turn out in the end? Is he when he got power, he changed? We mentioned a bit of that in the earlier, but we're going to see how that power becomes actual policy in this session here. Yeah. But just bear in mind, they were all on the same accord against Yazid. Within just a few years, everything turns around. Everything turns around. Okay. The first fracture is at the Battle of Jamal. Because Abdullah ibn Zubair, as I'm trying to reiterate, took the side of Sayyidina Aisha, his aunt, and his father, while al Hussein and Ali took the side of their father. So these two men were now against one another. At this battle, but they, they're both in their, in their mid-30s. Abdullah ibn Zubair was two years older than al Hussein. 35 and 37. So they were, all, they were men. They were not teenagers tagging along. They were not children who just didn't know what was happening. They were fully grown men with their own families, okay, in their mid-30s. So it's not something you can say, well, they didn't know what was happening at the time. They just happened to just follow their fathers. No, these were grown men at the time. They knew what was happening. They were cognizant of the surroundings, the situation as well, the gravity of it all. They knew what was happening, okay. And Abdul Malik ibn Marwan as well. So the great escape in the 60th year, this is when Muawiyah dies, Yazid is elected as the next Khalifa, and the bay'ah is now demanded of. Demanded of all right? So everybody has to go and give bay'ah. And as we covered before, al Hussein and Abdullah ibn Zubair both escaped Medina that night. It wasn't planned. They both escaped Medina. And they're in their late 50s now. This is about 25 years following the Battle of the Camel. 25 years later, 
And these men who are now in their late 50s are escaping for their lives. And of course, as we know, they meet up in Mecca. Each one asking the other, how did you get here? Okay. <laughs> but now they're united again. Upon what? Of course, upon uh, the issue of the Umayyads and Yazid. Okay. So, uh, so Kufa. So the great escape happens. Abdullah ibn Zubair and al Hussein ibn Ali meet up in Mecca. Why did they choose Mecca? Allah says in the Quran, Whoever enters the sanctuary of Mecca is safe. So it's a haram. Okay? So they knew that if we go to the haram in Mecca, the Umayyad authorities cannot pursue us. It's an amnesty area. We cannot be killed or apprehended. So this is a safe zone, literally. So they both went to Mecca to seek safety and cover. And they meet one another there. They begin to talk. And there's a camaraderie that develops within the two men because they're now on, they're both fugitives under the same authority of Yazid. But as they spent days and weeks together in Mecca, a certain dynamic develops because news has spread around the Muslim world that Al Hussein is currently seeking shelter in Mecca. And the supporters of his father in Kufa, because remember, Sayyidina Ali set his government in Kufa. They are now sending for Hussein to return to them. Come back to us, Ya Hussein, and be our leader. Okay? Because this is, your ba- this is your home. This is your home, Kufa. This is where your father established his government. This is your home until the Umayyads took it away. Come back to us, Ya Hussein, and Wallahi will help you. So they began to send letters, emissaries, representatives to give bay'ah, to offer him support, to offer him assurance that if you come to us, we are better uh, prepared to defend you. We have an army ready for you at your beck and call. Right. So the, the, the dynamic develops. Meanwhile, Abdullah ibn Zubair, he is, of course, a senior person, but he's not going to be considered the same as Al Hussein. Anywhere they go together, Al Hussein will shine brighter for obvious reasons. So Abdullah ibn Zubair, in the early days, he spent his time worshipping in seclusion, minding his own business. But it was very clear that these emissaries coming from Kufa with letters, incessant letters and invitations to Al Hussein, this became talk of the town. What is Hussein's next move? Okay, what is Hussein's next move? But again, I'm not going to dig into that side of the text. There are subtexts and narratives in a Tabari that mention a bit of jealousy. I'm going to be honest with you. Okay? They intimate a bit of jealousy from Abdullah ibn Zubair. Towards Al Hussein, because they're both, look, they're both the same age, 56, 58. Okay? They're both veterans of the great battles. They are both significant figures within Islam. Okay? Al Hussein, the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abdullah ibn Zubair, the grandson of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, radiallahu anhu. Al Hussein was the son of the fourth Khalifa. Abdullah ibn Zubair was a son of the first, was a grandson of the first uh, uh, Khalifa. Al Hussein, his mother was Fatima bint Muhammad. Al Zubair, his mother was uh, uh, Asma bint Abi Bakr. His auntie was Aisha bint Abi, bint Abi Bakr. So there is a lot there uh, on the scales. And he's observing that you're getting all the attention. I'm not getting the same attention here. Okay, so that is in the subtext. I'm being very generous with the way I'm describing it, but that is something to consider. And also the background history, they went to war against one another 30 years ago, 25 years ago, in the Battle of um, Basra. So there's a lot there. There's a lot happening in the background, okay? Don't allow someone to oversimplify it and say, oh, nothing happened, they were just there together, they were all friendly. Yeah, they were friendly, but there were realities at hand. al Hussein had to make a decision for himself. Do I stay in Mecca? And if I do so, I become a governor. I establish a government here and potentially rule the entire Hijaz? Or do I go to Kufa and beckon to the call of people in Kufa? Okay. Al Zubair, that would affect him. If Al Hussein remains in Mecca, what happens to Zubair? He becomes just a secondary figure. But if Al Hussein leaves Mecca, what happens to Al Zubair? He becomes prime candidate. Okay. And this dynamic wasn't lost to the people around Al Hussein, especially in Abdullah ibn Abbas. It wasn't lost to him. 
So he confronts Azubair, Ibn Zubair later on. Okay. Very fascinating stuff. Films should be made out of these. I mean, so many lessons to learn. Uh, but they were both well-intentioned. Both well-intentioned, righteous men who wanted the best for the Ummah. There was no ill intent. It's just the situation was at hand. This is what, this is what happened. Abdullah ibn Zubair, they described him as a very slim man, which resembles his grandfather, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is known as a very a slim, a slim, slender man with red cheeks, a protruding forehead and eyes, and a thin beard. So his grandson, Abdullah ibn Zubair, resembles him. You know, he's a slim man, medium height. Uh, his face was adorned with a thin beard also. He resembles Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu anhu. And Al-Hussein is described as the one who resembled Rasulullah the most amongst his grandchildren and children. When his head is severed and presented to uh, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad in Kufa, Anas ibn Malik was there in the court of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. And he says to him, this face is the one that resembles Rasulullah the most. So picture the, the, the scenario. You have two men in Mecca. One resembles Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. One resembles Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It's, it's amazing all this information. So you can imagine the 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 aura, but also the tension emitting from this. And they're both in Mecca. Al Hussein doesn't make a decision straight away. What he does is he sends his cousin ahead of him his first cousin you go ahead of me to Kufa and scout and have a look and see how the situation is is it really how it is because the people of Kufa were known to have been treacherous and cowardly, and cowardly people they betrayed and they failed Ali radiallahu anhu and they turned against al Hussein al Hassan they were fickle unreliable and cowardly so al Hussein, knowing this didn't just run to them he sent somebody ahead of him to go and verify he didn't just run into it head first. He sent someone who he could trust, his own cousin, Muslim Ibn Uqba. A Muslim, sorry, Muslim Ibn, uh, uh, my mind has gone blank now. Uh, Akil, Barakallahu Fikum, Ibn Akil. Somebody who can trust to go ahead of him to Kufa. And that's what happens. That's what happens. But let's look at the connection between Muslim and Al Hussein. They are both from the children of Abu Talib. They're both from the children of Abu Talib. Yeah? So they're direct cousins. So Aqil was a brother of Ali, radiallahu anhu, and their sons were cousins. So he's a close relative. You couldn't get any closer without being actual blood brothers. Yeah? He didn't send just anyone, he sent his close, effectively brother, Muslim ibn Aqil. He's reliable, he's virtuous, he's committed. And he's part of the household of Abdu uh, Ban uh, Hashim. So he's somebody who can be trusted with such a mission. It was a covert mission. It wasn't an open thing. He actually sent him to be effectively a low-level operative to hide himself, not to show himself as somebody prominent in society because at the time, Yazid had already seized power in Kufa, in Iraq. So they were already an authority the Umayyads in Iraq. So Muslim couldn't just go openly and solicit uh, support. He had to go under the cover of anonymity. So he does that. In the weeks and months to follow, al Hussein would receive information from Muslim, giving him updates. And the updates were very favorable. You have thousands of supporters. Every single day we have people coming and giving bayah, leaders of tribes and prominent people. And it's looking good. It's looking safe for you to travel to Kufa. This is one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why, Al Hussein developed the confidence to leave Mecca and to make his way towards Kufa. One of the reasons why. Okay. And a -Mus Muslim becomes a key actor and figure in this entire story. So he travels to Kufa, he finds shelter in the house of one of the most um, senior uh, um, tribesmen in Kufa, Hani ibn Urwa. So this man gives him a home, a safe stay effectively, and it was all under the cover of anonymity, it was hidden, but every night following began to gather. 
So Kufa now was priming itself to receive Al Hussein. And Muslim was in the field and was able to attest to the fact that they're telling the truth now. It's not it's not fabricated, it's actually we have supporters on the ground. He would send correspondence back to Mecca and Al Hussein would now have to make a decision whether to cash in the check or whether to stay in Mecca. Okay. So while this was happening, Yazid had sent some of his uh, officers to be so notified that the spot where he was staying in was identified by Yazid and his authorities. So he had to move. He had to move locations twice. So he moved locations twice. But he wasn't yet aware that the operation itself was under the Umayyad eye. They already knew. They were already aware of what was happening. Okay. That realization comes a bit later, unfortunately. Comes a bit too late. Okay. And this is why Al Hussein is not alerted early enough to make a decision to stay in, in Mecca. He's just not aware. Okay. So 18,000 people come. 18,000 people come. Well, through representatives, of course, tribes and clans and families, to support Al Hussein by giving bay'ah to Muslim. And so Muslim sends news back to Mecca. We have 18,000 people. I think we're good to go now. Back in Mecca, Al Hussein is drawing near to the, to the final phase of his stay in Mecca. He has to make a decision. Okay. Muslim is sending me messages back, telling me it's all good. We have 18,000 supporters. The ground is clear. We should have a strong force on the ground when we get there. And we could potentially launch some sort of uh, resistance government or opposition from Kufa. After all, Kufa was a city where his father has established his own government. So it wasn't new territory. So he began to discuss with people around him, most particularly Abdullah ibn Zubair and uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas. Most particularly Abdullah ibn Zubair, Abdullah ibn Abbas. Abdullah ibn uh, Zubair initially said to him, and this is, find it in the books, it's in, in great detail, but in the essence of it being, Hussein, if I was in your position, I would go to Kufa, I wouldn't be in Mecca. If I had that many number of supporters in a city such as Kufa, I would leave and go to Kufa. And that contributed, I'm not going to say it made the decision, but it contributed towards Hussein deci deciding to leave Mecca. Okay. So that conversation is a difficult conversation to unpack because it will then imply that Abdullah ibn Zubair is either setting Hussein up for failure or is finding a way to get him out of the equation. That's one interpretation. If you read, and I read, I've read the Muslim and classical texts by necessity, but also the Orientalist texts. You have to read both perspectives. They have a more sinister agenda for Abdullah ibn Zubair. If you look at, for example, Julius Wellhausen, the Arab Kingdom and its fall, it's more sinister. Yeah. But you have to read both perspectives. Allah Kulli Hal, he advises him that if I was in your position, such a, such a prominent man with so many prospects in life and so many supporters, I wouldn't be here in Mecca. Because Mecca is restricted, right? The mountains, it's not somewhere you can fight. It's, it's limited. But Kufa, Kufa, I mean, Kufa is the center of the world at that time. You have Basra next door. You have supporters on the ground. I would be there. So al Hussein is encouraged to leave Mecca. At the time in Kufa, however, going back to Kufa, so al Hussein is now warming up to the idea, I'm going to go to Kufa. In Kufa, the governor at the time was Nu'man ibn Bashir. Okay? He was a very famous, of course, Sahabi, a great man. And he was aware because this, the intelligence system uh, network knew that something is happening in Kufa. They knew about Muslim, but they didn't take action yet. Nu'man ibn Bashir, knowing this, purposefully decided not to take action. And when he was questioned about this, why don't you move in and just crush them and expose the whole, the whole uh, movement? He says, I do not wage war against whoever does not wage war against me, nor do I ambush whoever does not ambush me. In other words, I'm not going to attack them or crush them until they make the first move. Why? Because he didn't want to go against Ahl al-Bayt. Yes, he was a governor of the Umayyads, but he was a righteous man. He didn't want to be one of those men 
who are participating in the bloodshed of Ahl al-Bayt. So he says, so long as they remain peaceful and undercover, I'm going to pretend I didn't see anything, okay? Until they take action, I'm going to do nothing. That wasn't sufficient for Yazid and his cronies, so they got rid of him. Now, Man bin Bashir was a righteous man, okay? But when they got rid of him, Yazid, out of desperation, desperation, picked a man who's only 25 years of age, they're the same age, 25, 28, 20 is kids, boys. He picks Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, who at the time was a governor of Basra. Now, how did Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad get into the position? Very simple. His father, Ziyad ibn Abihi, I mentioned him in the previous unit, was the governor at the time, one of the best governors, by the way, in Iraq, under the, under the government of Sayyidina Ali, one of the best, righteous, most effective governors under Sayyidina Ali. When Sayyidina Ali was eliminated after the Battle of Sifin, Sayyidina Muawiyah traveled uh, to Iraq and he was recruiting all of the senior governors and supporters of Ali under his cabinet. He wanted to make sure that he had them on, on board effectively to help him manage the situation in Iraq. One of the key figures was Ziyad ibn Abihi. Ziyad dies, Muawiyah dies. Their sons take over. Yazid takes over, the Khilafah, and Ubaidullah, even his name is diminutive, so Ubaidullah, the little Abdullah, <laughs> takes over. But he's not good as a governor. He doesn't meet his father's standards. Uh, so he was about to be sacked by Yazid. But when Nu'man bin Bashir was considered too soft or complicit with Banu Hashim, they got rid of him, and the next person in line was Ubaidullah ibn Ziyah. What a catastrophic candidate, subhanAllah. What a, what a bad decision Yazid took on that day. But he had no choice. Because Ziyad was, at the time, governing Basra, the neighboring city. The first person in history at that time to have had both cities under his governorship. It was a desperate move from Yazid. And you would see it's going to be a very, very cat catastrophic decision to make, honestly. One of the worst decisions that he, has, he had made in his premiership. And so Ziyad becomes the next man, and he is now sent to Kufa with 25 soldiers. 25 soldiers. He has a palace in Kufa. He takes position, and he begins his first mission. The reason why he was elected was to crush Muslim and the opposition. That was his mission. And Ubaidullah was a man who was more than happy and motivated to do so. He wasn't like Nu'man ibn Bashir, principled. He was more than happy to carry the job out and in gruesome form as well. So he takes position, he sits down in the palace, and he begins to send orders. Unfortunately for Muslim, Ibn Aqil, news of his operation had now been foiled. With the arrival of Ubaidullah in Kufa, and the dismissal of a somewhat, you could say, benevolent governor, not man, the heat was on. So Ubaidullah decides to move locations, but more than that, he decides to actually assassinate Ubaidullah. A uh, Muslim decides to assassinate Ubaidullah. So he's moved around a few safe houses until he eventually ends up in one of the houses of Sharik ibn al Awar. Sharik ibn al Awar was another leading figure in Kufa, and he gave cover to Muslim, and together they decided to assassinate Ubaidullah. And the plot was as follows. We're going to invite Ubaidullah to the residence. He's only recently arrived in Kufa. I'm one of the chiefs. I'm going to invite him for dinner. And while I entertain him and occupy him with conversation, I'm going to give the signal for water to be brought out. So I'm going to say water uh, for one of the servants to bring water. When I say water, Muslim would come out and stab Ubaidullah. That was the plan. Right? So they concocted the plan, they agreed upon it, and they set the date. On the day in which Ubaidullah arrived for this dinner, he was kept occupied with conversation and small talk until the moment in which Sharik made the signal. He said, water, water, for the servant to come. At that moment, Muslim Ibn Aqil froze. He panicked. And he began to think, Rasulullah wasallam forbade uh, forbade um, khayana, uh, treachery. This is not Islamic to, to, 
to betray people, to be treacherous. So he began to have a crisis of morality, his thinking and ethics. Is this the right thing to do? So, and he misses the opportunity. By the time <laughs> he realizes that you know uh, it's taking a bit too long for water to arrive, Ubaidullah realizes something is up here. So he makes an excuse and leaves swiftly. That was a trigger. That was a trigger. That was it. At that moment, the fall was fully plotted. It was confirmed. And Ubaidullah went back to his palace and began to make plans. Now, realizing what had happened, Muslim and Sharik decide to take the offensive. Eh? The best form of defense is what? Is offense. So they decide to take, listen to this, 40,000 soldiers. They're finally coming out now. 40,000 men pavilion. And he's just looking at them. He's amused by this. Because they don't realize that the key chieftains who invited Muslim and uh, Al Hussein to Kufa were in the palace, welcoming Ubaidullah to Kufa and pledging bay'ah to him. They had already turned against him, and so when he stands in the pavilion, he's looking at Ubay he's looking at Muslim with forty thousand men. The other men come behind him, and Ubaid and Muslim realizes they've betrayed us. So Ubaidullah mocks and says to him, "Listen." For the 40,000 men, I give you an opportunity now to walk away and nothing happens to you. Leave Muslim by himself. This has nothing to, do with you, nothing to do with you. Everyone go home and no persecution will happen for anyone who goes home. Leave Muslim by himself. And so, unfortunately, believe this or not, in the same day, 39,500 of them went home. And within a few hours, by Maghrib time, there were only 500 men left standing at the gate. And Muslim is now in a position where he realizes I'm fully compromised. I no longer have this, it's evaporated. And they have betrayed me at the last moment. At this moment he realizes he's finished. Okay, there's no point resisting. We've been compromised. They've betrayed me. 40,000 people, they've betrayed me. And the only thing left is sure death. There's nothing left. It's guaranteed death for me. Okay. So he's taken to the palace and he's going to confront Ubaidullah. Ubaidullah, by the way, is just laughing because for him it's just, uh, it was never serious for the people of Kufa. They were just pulling levers and playing around. They were never serious about fighting on behalf of Ahl al-Bayt. And they lured him into this situation and then abandoned him. Unfortunately for al Hussein, this event happened so quickly that there was no time for Muslim to convey the message back to Mecca, tell him, don't come, stay where you are. So he leaves for, for Karbala. Uh, now, on his way out of Mecca towards Kufa, he meets a group of Arab travelers coming from Kufa towards Mecca. And they tell him that the roads, the main roads have been blocked the main roads have been blocked, okay? Yazid has ordered for the main roads to be blocked. He was a bit suspicious, he wasn't aware of, as to why. He wasn't aware that actually they're preparing to intercept your caravans and to effectively eliminate. That's why they actually had to block certain roads to direct traffic elsewhere. So although he was suspicious, he didn't yet have confirmation that what had happened had happened already to a Muslim. So he still was a bit on the edge, but he continued forward. Now, part of the narrative, and this has been, again, some people dispute this, but it's worth mentioning. Abdullah ibn Umar, from Medina, he heard about the issue in Mecca. And so he travels by horse, and he manages to catch up to Al-Hussein. It's part of the narrative. Some people consider it a weird narration, but it's, I'm just gonna mention it to complete the narrative. Abdullah ibn Umar catches up to the caravans, and he embraces Allah Hussein, says to him, please, my brother, don't go. He says to him something very, very, very profound. This issue of leadership and worldly power is not for you, ya Ahl al-Bayt. Because Rasulullah when the angel came to him in the last phase of his life and said to him, Ya Rasulullah, you have an option to be a king on earth and to enjoy the glory of the earth and then to die in God's Jannah or to remain a humble servant of Allah and to die now and go to Jannah. He chose the latter. When he chose the latter, it, was, it wasn't just for him, it was for his descendants. Meaning, his descendants would also not be in positions of leadership. 
kings and khulafa. He said that to him, he said to him, that dua wasn't just for him, it was also for you. And look at the lineage, look at what happened to Al-Hasan, look what happened to you. Yeah. You will always be in a position where you're being oppressed. And if you look at the lineage of the Imams, they were not leaders in that position. They were spiritual leaders, but not kings and khulafa. They were always oppressed. Okay, So he says to him, it's not going to work out for you, Ya Hussein, please stay. But at this point, Al Hussein knew that, okay, something is on the horizon. But he says to him, I would rather leave. If I'm going to die, if that's what's waiting, written for me in Kufa, let me die in Kufa. I'd rather die in Kufa than die in Mecca. I don't want to draw to Mecca bloodshed and, and, and fighting. Let me die in, Mecca, in, in, in Kufa. So he, nobody can console him, and he's eventually continuing his journey. Okay? But it really hits him when he meets the first contingent of soldiers. It really hits him. And this is now concrete reality when he's intercepted by one of two armies that would meet him on the way to Karbala, one of two armies. And he realizes, no, this is actually for real. Okay? Uh, in a very kind of very sad, very, really very, very um, moving account, he comes across uh, near Nineveh, the biblical town of Nineveh, across one of the army uh, units, the head of which actually greets Al Hussein, recognizes him, and they pray together. And he allows Al Hussein to lead him in prayer and his men in prayer. So he effects, effectively defected to Hussein and says to him, I will fight on your behalf. I'm not going to attack you. I will send to attack you. I'm going to fight on your behalf. However, I would advise you not to continue the, the road, okay? Because what's waiting on the other side is really not very good for you. But Al Hussein continues. He continues on the journey until he gets to a place known as Karbala. Karbala, on the outskirts of Kufa. He's reached, really, the vicinity of Kufa, about to enter the city. There is a place outside known as Karbala. And there's a lot of folklore and tales spun around this event when he reach, reaches that place. Uh, in that he says, for example, uh, he says, what is this place known as? What's the name of this place? And they say to him, it's called Karbala. And so he repeats, Karb, Bala, Karb, Bala, which is difficulty and, and, and tragedy. Difficulty and tragedy. Karb, Bala, that's the name, Karbala. It's a place, it's an ominous site. This is where I've reached, effectively. So he, he encounters Al-Hur ibn Yazid. And Al-Hur ibn Yazid was the one who turned and said, I'm going to support you now and lets him know what's happening on the other side and that the army is waiting for him. So he tells him, please, you know, don't go ahead. Al Hussein insists he's going to continue the journey. However, in being fair, he tells his companions, those who accompanied him this far, after the Salah, he says, listen, I'm going to enter a new and very dangerous path ahead of us. I will not blame anyone who turns around and goes back to Mecca. You have an opportunity now to turn around, save yourselves, and return to Mecca, and you will not be blamed. His closest companions refused to leave him, they, as they agreed to accompany him to the next terminus, effectively Karbala. Okay. So they leave, and they're heading towards Karbala, which is the final station. When there is Karbala, there is already an army waiting for them there. Okay. And the army is not accompanied by just ordinary soldiers. You have in the army some of the very men who sent invitations to Hussein in Mecca. The same leaders in Kufa, the same tribal leaders, their faces were present amongst the crowd. And he knew them because he lived in Kufa before. So he recognized these people. There were also men watching from the distance. They invited Hussein, his hair now. Right? But they can see that he's in a death trap. So Al Hussein, and again, this the story becomes very elaborate, according to which sources you cite, very elaborate. He calls them by name. He talks to them directly. Allah kulli hal, he can see them there. They are there. It's a death trap, and he realizes that uh, we're not going to make it. We're not going to make it. You know. So he makes a decision to somehow try to negotiate peaceful terms. Okay. Depending on, again, which narrative you read, some people say he didn't surrender, he just wanted negotiation. Others say he did surrender and he wanted to make bay'ah to Yazid directly. 
yeah? the net net of it is he decided to come to some sort of peaceful um, terms where he would promise not to fight and not to raise an army in Kufa but rather to turn around and go to Damascus directly where he would meet Yazid in person and again based on narrative either give him bayah this is over, I'm not seeking any leadership anymore, I'm just going to give you bayah or let's negotiate terms Ubaidullah, who was in his palace was sent news of this and he refused flat out, he said no, you are not going to travel to Damascus you either give bay'ah to me and I'll convey it to the Amir al muminin or we're going to deal with you. Okay? al Hussein refused to give bay'ah to this 25 year old snotty nosed brat, effectively. He said, no, I'm not going to give bay'ah to you. And so that was basically the end of negotiated terms. And the orders were given to effectively attack al Hussein. So on the morning of the 10th of Al Ashura, in Muharram, on Yom Jum'ah, the soldiers began to attack the camp. Al Hussein's tent, where his family and his female relatives and children were, were, were seeking shelter, was set on fire. And those relatives scurried out of, this, of the uh, tent and barely made it out. The armies then began to pick off one by one the soldiers around Al Hussein. They wouldn't attack Hussein straight away. Nobody wanted to be the first person to take responsibility for killing the grandson of Rasulullah so they didn't attack him, they attacked the people around him and they, begin, they began to execute and kill and target people and they left him until it came to the point where uh, there was only one thing left to do so they surrounded him and by the way I'm really summarizing this story in great detail, I mean the glory details I'm summarizing it in the cleanest way possible, the most concise form they surround him, effectively and they're looking at him. So everyone's looking, what do we do now? So the leader amongst them says to them, well, strike. Let somebody pierce him with their sword or perhaps with a, with a, with a spear. Someone should do the first, make the first move. And that was done. One of the men, a horseman, came with his spear and he pierced the body of al Hussein. When that happened, all hell broke loose. So they began to shoot arrows at him. So now it was done. So he did the first move. Effectively, sim symbolically, he started this. We can join in. And they began to attack him. This went on for a long time. He was seeking water. Uh, but the Euphrates was nearby. And they stopped him. They blocked him from seeking water from the banks of the Euphrates. He wasn't allowed to seek water to quench his thirst. Instead, they shot him in his neck. Okay. Shot him in his neck. Now, there are some narratives again. I'm going to sprinkle it in there, that one of his uh, female relatives said that they saw a dream before that happened. We saw a dream that Rasulullah was standing on the banks of the Euphrates and he took the earth in his hands and he kissed it. And he said, this is where my grandson is going to be martyred. They killed him and once he was actually effectively taken down, it was a frenzy. And they began to really lay in. Uh, to the point, at Tabari reports that they actually took their horses and trampled his dead body until his flesh was uh, uh, mingled and mangled with the earth. Yeah? That's how much savagery and brutality was inflicted upon him. They began to trample upon his body until the flesh was mangled with the earth. Okay? And that was the end of it. His, body, his head was taken, of course, another trophy, taken back to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. When it arrived, now this is where it becomes a bit, again, controversial because some people say the head of Hussein only went to Ubaidullah in Kufa. It never reached Yazid. The predominant narrative is Ubaidullah looked at it, played around with it, and then sent it to Yazid. And at the time when it arrived in the court of Yazid in Damascus, he was eating, he was having a company of a Christian, because Damascus had Christians, right? One of the Christian emissaries, a Christian dignitaries, and the, the head of Hussein was presented to him on a, on a silver platter. And the Christian said to him, We would never treat the grandson of Isa the way you treat the grandson of your prophet. And that upset Yazid, okay? according to the narrative. When he heard that, he felt ashamed and upset. And he began to curse Ubaidullah. I never, I never ordered you to do this. Apprehend them, stop them. I never said kill them. 
but it was too late because the children who survived, one of the boys who survived, uh, Zainul Abidin, he was, too, he was too young and frail. He wasn't killed, the others were killed, and the rest were all women. They were all brought into the presence of Yazid, and he took them in. For three days they were allowed to mourn in dignity. Um, they came in a very, very distressed and um, really difficult situation ordeal. They were actually, uh, the soldiers of Yazid and Ubaidullah had actually fettered them with iron fetters and cuffs to their legs and hands. These are the children of Rasulullah and the women folk. The clothes were ripped, the hair was uncouth, is unkempt, dust on the face, and they were brought before Yazid. And in the court of Yazid, some of the men around Yazid were saying to him, allow us to take this one as a concubine and that one as a concubine. They wanted the women as concubines. These are the children and grandchildren of Rasulullah Yazid had enough decency, if anything left of decency, to say no. I will not permit you to take the grandchildren of Rasulullah's concubines. And so he gave them a place to stay and he would eat with them every single day. He would keep company, have discussions with them. And after a while, he ordered that they be taken back to Medina uh, with guards and in honor. And they were taken back to Medina with the young boy in their presence, Zain al Abidin. Okay. The narrative at this point becomes very shaky because in the Sunni tradition, all the blame is placed upon Ubaidullah. He did it. Yazid didn't order him to do that. Yazid was penitent, he regretted it, he made an effort, he cursed Ubaidullah. If you go to the Shia tradition, the blame goes to Yazid. He gloats, he's happy when he sees the head of Hussein on a platter. We're not going to delve into that today, but you can read it into the text. Ala Kullihal al Hussein is exterminated, he's killed, his children are taken as captives, and effectively there is no more opposition from Banu Hashim, it's over, it's over. From that moment onwards, they will all just be, uh, you could say, uh, subdued by the government, including the Abbasid government will also subdue them. And they were always persecuted under the governments that followed. Yeah. So the story did not end well when it came to the mission to Karbala. Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, back in Mecca, News arrived that Al Hussein is being eliminated. So Al Hassan is gone, Al Hussein is gone, and the only person left now is Abdullah ibn Zubair, which opens up another chapter when it comes to the history of the Muslims. Abdullah ibn Zubair is the last man standing now. Okay. We're now going to look at the sources because. We're going to be covering Karbala, we're going to be covering the siege of Mecca, assassinations, massacres. I don't want any of the detail to be taken as just, oh, it's just information, it's not really sahih, it's not authentic, I don't have to take it, it's not something that I have to worry about. Let's authenticate, let's understand the sources upon which we're going to build the narrative. Okay? When it comes to the events that really haunt the 60s, there is a specific genre of historiography known as al-maqatil. Al-maqatil is martyrology. So in the same way you have al-maghazi, which deals with the battles, you have al-siyar, which deals with the biographies, you have al-wafayat, which deals with the deaths. He died this year, he died this year, he died this year. You have al-manaqib, that deals with the, the, the virtues of people. You have another chapter in history known as uh, al-maqatil, the martyrology how somebody died it's a specific field in historiography how somebody died the history of his death right and the leading authority for sunni and shi'i who lived at that time shortly thereafter in the same epoch was a man known as abu mikhnaf abu mikhnaf this is his uh, patronym but his full name is lord ibn yahya ibn sa'd ibn mikhnaf ibn sulaym al-azdi and his great-grandfather, it is said, was a companion of Rasulullah He met him, he made bay'ah, and he was a companion. And they belonged to the Azd tribe, which was prominent in Kufa. He's also Al-Kufi, he's from Kufa. So this man is the single most widely cited authority. Both Sunni and Shi'i authorities cite him 
for the Mekta al-Hussein, the martyrdom of Hussein. The entire episode of going to Kufa and the letters and what happens in Karbala, the number one authority that everybody cites, including a Tabari, Ibn Kathir, all of them cite him is Abu Mekhnaf. If you take Abu Mekhnaf out of the equation, you have no Mekta al-Hussein, you have no Karbala. He's a pivotal, pivotal authority. Now the reason why this is important is because many people, especially from the Sunni school, Dismiss Abu Mekhnaf. He was a liar. He was a Shia. He wasn't really authentic. Uh, if you remove him from the equation, you have nothing left of the historic narrative. You have nothing left. Because a tabari could only quote Abu Mekhnaf. There's nobody else to quote. Abu Mekhnaf, uh, his family ties. He was from a prominent family. His father, his grandfather, his uncles had all participated in Sifin the Battle of Sifin, and other key battles in Basra and Kufa. They were eyewitnesses. They were commanders of their tribes. So these were not just ordinary people. They were in the mix of it all. This family was in the mix of it all. And Abu Mekhnaf was the one who put it all to pen, to paper. He was the one who began to write. He would interview his relatives. What happened on that day? What did you see? What happened at Karbala? Some of his relatives were, were actually present at Karbala. So he's a key, key, key citation. And oftentimes, as I said, when people want to dismiss the issue of Karbala and what happened and all this issue and tension, they will, go, they will strike at the root of it all by saying, if it comes from Abu Mekhnaf, ignore it. If it comes from Abu this is a false narrative. And quite frankly, if you take that approach, ignore everything in history because <laughs> that approach is not consistent, it's not congruent. Okay? He is certainly, he ticks all the right boxes in the right location, He's a Kufan for many generations. He, began, he, be, he belongs to a tribe that was very, very well known and were supporters of Ali radiallahu anhu. They were well-known supporters of Ali in Kufa. They were not just all, they were well-known figures within the administration of Kufa. They went to war with Ali radiallahu anhu and commanded armed battalions. And he met them, of course his own ancestry and his own father, his own uncles. They gave him eyewitness testimony. He was in the right place. He wasn't in Mecca writing, or he wasn't in the Mecca. He was in Kufa writing. When the memory is still alive, people are still talking, and he's writing everything down. Very important. So he's born, in, he dies in the year 774. The story that actually delves and details, the gory details, and there are things that are exaggerated, of course. For example, when uh, Al Hussein is killed, Ibn Kathir says this, that it's complete fabrication, that the water in the Euphrates became red of blood. All the water in the rivers became red with blood, and you could hear jinns crying, and there were supernatural events. And, uh, uh, the clouds, the sky changed color, and you could hear voices coming out of the... He said, this is all fabrication. It's just added uh -huh. embellishment. However, the acts that were carried out were very clear, and they're documented. at tabari Ibn Kathir, all the minute details as to how he was killed, and also cursing, because when the women were taken, they were also being cursed. In the court of Ubaidullah, he actually cursed them. When the woman stood in front of him, he began to curse them and the house of Rasulullah And then he sent them to Yazid, his, his, uh, his patron. So the details that you would want to look into, if you want to really get into this in detail, is Abu Mekhnaf, Mekhtal Hussein. It's a specific genre of book, you can find it, Mekhtal, the martyrdom of Hussein. There are many versions of this. Certainly. But if you read Ibn Kathir or Ibn At-Tabari, it's in there anyway. It's in there anyway. Okay? But we want to know whether this man is credible or not, and whether or not he was a Shia. History is a casualty in a war of identity and ideology. It's a casualty. Okay? History and historical record and the integrity of history is a casualty. Because in the, you could say in the hierarchy of importance, what matters more? that we have a theology that we can uphold and a perspective, politically speaking, that we can uphold or that we acknowledge certain positions that are very difficult to actually untangle. When you delve into the issue of Karbala and how Al-Hassan was assassinated, I believe was, he, was, he was poisoned, I'm sorry. I'm a Sunni, but I believe he was poisoned. I don't believe in the story, it was just a stomach cancer. I don't buy that. I'm not going to fool myself into believing that he just died naturally. And then also fool myself into believing that actually Al Hussein, it was all Ubaidullah's doing. He was a wild horse. He just did what he wanted to do. Yazid had no part in it. He, he was shocked and he was lamenting. He was crying. I don't buy that either. 
there were sufficient opportunities to intervene and stop what was happening and to make especially after Muslim was killed come on I mean <laughs> you have opportunities to say you're going way too far you killed Muslim I didn't demand that from you the, the head was sent to Damascus so we know that Yazid was aware of that assassination he didn't stop it so the excuse that he didn't know he couldn't take it that far that's mute he knew that Ubaidullah was a kind of character who had no problem killing Ahlul Bayt because uh, uh, Muslim Ibn Aqil was actually the grandson of uh, he was a nephew to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so, you know, you have to be consistent and congruent. Don't be inconsistent up and down. He was capable of doing these things, and he demonstrated that too. In fact, he was doing it to appeal to Yazid. And Yazid showed no sign of, hey, this is too much. You shouldn't have killed Muslim. So these are things that, the reality of it, look, we would rather overlook this instance, because if we get into it in detail, as Sunni Muslims, there are some difficult questions that the, the Shia could then present to us and the people in between can be lost. Or they may even turn around and say, actually, that makes a lot of sense. And there's a Shia sympathy that we don't want to get into. So at the, at the, at the expense of getting into the real history, we're just going to dismiss it. It doesn't matter. Be quiet about it. Uh, and just, it doesn't matter. Allah will judge and leave it at that. Whereas the Shia, and this is their prime uh, grievance against the Sunni, is that you are covering up a crime. And you refuse to acknowledge wrongdoing. So when they talk of justice and adala, they talk of the Sunni, our school, as being unjust. And we are people who support unjust rulers. We are people who support unjust rulers. And we are able to do so without even considering the justice element. Where is the justice for Hussein? Where is the justice for Hassan? For Al -Hassan? But you find the apologetics amongst the Sunni school. And I understand. Listen, I understand. I get it. These stories and this history can lead people into certain directions, emotionally speaking. It can really instigate, I understand. More importantly, it can give legitimacy to the Shia cause. Right? It can give legitim legit legitimacy. We know that because that, that generation alive at the time, many of those A'imma, Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, he was supporting <laughs> Ahlul Bayt against uh, the Abbasids. Many of the early A'imma were supporters of Ali and Banu Hashim. Naturally so. Right? But for fear of getting the general Muslim involved in these discussions and uncovering the reality, that's the reality unfortunately, let's just tell them it doesn't matter. The sources are not relevant anyway. And if you look at Imam al-Ghazali, if you look at Imam al-Suyuti, if you look at Imam... Uh, uh, if you look at uh, we looked at this uh, for example um, Ibn Khaldun how he talks of Yazid and Hussein these are hard hitting facts Hussein was wrong to go against the authority Yazid had to do what he had to do right that's a normative stance in the Sunni school and it's very difficult to acknowledge right but we are mature people and we're able to navigate the narrative without fa falling into the pitfalls of emotionalism sentimental attachment and uh, emotional outburst, but the reality, if it must be told, is that there is a basis for grievance against Banu Umayyah and the historians who support Banu Umayyah, which is why the Shia call us the sons of Yazid. They call us Yazidis. The Sunnis call the Yazidi, son of Yazid. And when they witness, for example, what happens in Palestine and things that happen against the Sunni in the Sunni world, they will say that's what they do. They don't support the, the innocent, they always support the oppressors. That's how they look at us. Right? So it goes deeper than history, but we want to understand the historical perspective. We don't want to be blind sheep, as Ibn Khaldun says, pasturing or grazing in the pastures of stupidity. We want to investigate and understand from the source itself, what does it say? And quite frankly, it's inexcusable. If you look at the details of the treatment of uh, Ahlul Bayt, I didn't go into details. I did not go into details. It's inexcusable. I cannot fathom an excuse for Yazid. I can't. But in order to prevent a greater harm, what we know in fiqh as Siddha Diraya. Siddha Diraya is, if there's a greater harm that could be caused through a certain means, you have to cut the means. Siddha Diraya, you cut the means of the greater harm. The greater harm in this case is to legitimate a perspective from the Shia perspective. Uh, if, we talk, if we tell these stories as they are, we acknowledge the wrongdoing, the injustice, we may cause people to sympathize with the Shia. That's a greater harm. So we need to dismiss it at the root cut it off and just 
uh, effectively just you know just make excuses that are convenient for us, yeah. which is why it's very hard to kind of um, to be respected as a Muslim historian when you look at, for example, the secular historians. They have no problem. <laughs> Julius Wellhausen, Patricia Crone, and the likes. They have no problem telling you, well, there was a plot here, there was a coup there, there was, a, there, was in, there was intention here for power grab, there was betrayal here, there was oppression there. Because for them, it's not a reverential study. They're not here to deal with the reverential aspect of the personalities involved. They're here to look at the details, the evidence, where it directs. What does this mean for us? And so in their books, they are more candid. Of course, they exaggerate. But they, have, they don't have, the, they don't have the, um, the handicap we have as practicing Muslims. I consider myself very orthodox in Islam, uh, inshallah. But when it comes to historiography, I don't want to be given softeners. Give me the information as it is. Don't filter it for me. Let me take the full nutrient and I will look at the information in context. It doesn't have to have an impact on my faith. But I would like to know what actually went down on that day. Who did what? Okay, I need to know from the other perspective, what we call advocacy, another principle in historiography, the advocacy principle. Why would the, the Shia school look at Yazid and us Sunnis in this perspective? Let's advocate for them. Why would they possibly have a grudge? If you look at the information objectively, come on, you have to be honest. You have to be honest. Yeah. So these are the things that we find uh, later on, however, as we know, and I've tried to kind of have mentioned this many times, what became, what began as a political rift between Shi'at Ali, to be a Shi'at Ali in that day and age was not a, a theological pronouncement, it was just a political position. I support Ali and his sons as legitimate rulers to be a Shi'at Ali. By that definition, Kufa was Shi'at Ali and many Sahaba Shi'at Ali. Later on, it became a theology distinct from the Sunni school of thought because it was all codified. Imam al-Tahawi's uh, Aqidah, his uh, Aqidah al-Tahawiyah, we have in there the articles, one being that we as Sunnis in our school of thought, we do take, we follow the leader, even if he's corrupt, so long as he has, he allows the prayers, so on. These are things that are codified later on because it, it's by necessity, right? But in codifying these things, we oftentimes miss the context in which it was actually written. Why was it written that way? What were the conditions for that? And it goes back to Karbala, and it goes back to these terrific events actually that unfold in the first century of Islam, which we should be candid and open. Because if somebody comes to you who's well versed in this history, a non-Muslim, for example, who doesn't really care about the um, if this is Sahaba or not Sahaba, he just wants to get to the detail, he can give you, rattle off a list of atrocious events that happened between the companions at that time, Yazid and his men, and Ahl al-Bayt, he can rattle off. And it's all in Tabari. It's not in another book, it's in Tabari in Ibn Kathir. It's all in there. Okay? Which can cause a person who's not prepared for that information to have a crisis of faith. Oh, I didn't know this happened. How can this happen? No one told me about this. So we want to prepare ourselves for that sort of discussion, confrontation really, by reading it in context, okay, so we understand, and also the raison d'être, why is a Sunni school so reluctant to acknowledge what happened on the, in that day and leading up to that day? And why is it so keen on covering up for Yazid? The reason, as I said, said the Diraya, is that there's a greater harm. We would rather the casualty be history than being Aqeedah or being something else which is more important than history. Okay? These are the considerations, and it's very interesting because, again, uh, history is not s supposed to be interpreted just one way. There are various perspectives. And sometimes it's a spectrum. The Shia are right in this perspective, and the Sunnis in this perspective. Okay? But we need to know the full range of ideas. And uh, again, one way to stop you doing that is to tell you that the source author, Abu Mekhnaf, is a Shia. His unruh is a liar. And these are deceptive means of dissuading you from reading further into the text. As I said before, a lie in hadith literature is different from a liar in actual terms. And the Shia he mentioned here is Shia Ali in general terms. <laughs> He's not a Shia by definition. Based on his Aqidah, he's Shia in that he lived in Kufa. By default, you're a Shia Ali anyway. But also he was writing uh, the information in a way that he wasn't hiding the information. He was being very clear. But what I like about Abu Mehtaf is he was very scientific about it. He interrogated sources. He didn't just take he interrogated sources. So I, I would like to say, um, you know, um, the Sufi tradition, they are very detailed about telling 
the intimate details about what happened in Karbala there, as opposed to what you you might find in this very generic mainstream Sunni uh, narrations. The Sufis will will be very distinct and very detailed in their narrations about Karbala. And and why? Why do you think that is? Well, I think I think the uh, the the Sufis tend to be less apologetic about their love for the Ahlul Bayt. But why? Why? Because I mean, they they all have a tradition that goes back to uh, Imam Ali. Yes, that's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Except for one that goes back to Sena. Yeah, exactly. Abu Bakr Siddiq. So the but Sufi. That, even even that goes through Jafar as Sadiq anyway. Then... There we are. There we are. So the reason why, because the Ahlul Bayt in the Sufi, and by the way, in that early phase of Tasawwuf, you had Shia Tasawwuf and Sunni Tasawwuf also. And there was a Shia strand. This, you still have some strands of that. But they, the spiritual... So when I mention Abdullah ibn Umar saying that you will never be leaders in the sense of governorship, but you will be imams in spirituality, this is where that imamit comes from. right? They are the moral authority. The spiritual authority are Ahlul Bayt. Whereas the, the earthly authorities, Banu Abbas and Banu Umayya, they are the kings and the rulers and sultans, but the real spiritual leaders are Ahlul Bayt. So the Tasawwuf tradition traces its way, all of them, by the way, except as I mentioned before, Naqshbandiya and her brother corrected me, even that went through one of the A'imma, Imams. They trace it back through al Hussein and Al-Hassan, back to Sayyidina Ali. So there's a, there's a connection there with that story. Right? There's a connection there. And again, within the Sunni school, there's another, I don't want to be too explicit, but there are other groups, right? And some are more detached from that story than others. Exposing the public to this sort of literature and history has an emotive edge which can be politicized and then utilized to get rid of governments. So the best way to avoid all of that headache is just not to talk about it, to dismiss it as just fantasy and folklore, exaggeration, propaganda. And we don't have to talk about that. Let's just talk about the other issues in the Muslim Ummah. Yeah. But it is a relevant consideration. We want to know about these details because we learn from them. At the very least, there's a didactic value to it. We can learn from them. Okay. All right, so that is Abu Mikhnaf. Let's move on. Uh, at Tabari, in his appendix, at the end of his massive histories, he talks about uh, Abu Mikhnaf. Okay. And this is where he mentions him. And he talks about Abu Mikhnaf, his death, he confirms uh, his ancestry. They died in the Battle of Jam uh, uh, Basra. They were present effectively. And Abu Mikhnaf, a descendant, was amongst the people from whom we take historical events. Khalas, it's in the book. Okay, It's been confirmed. And the volume is 39, and that's where he talks about the biographies of people who died. And he mentions Abu Mikhnaf there. We take from him. We take from him. When he says we, the Sunni scholarship, we take from him. And that is something to keep in mind, okay? All right, so now I'm going to challenge you. I've opened a can of worms, okay? I've told you about certain topics that are for power within Sunni tradition. I'm a Sunni, I'm not hiding in. There's no taqiyah here, I'm a Sunni, alhamdulillah. An orthodox Sunni. Uh, however, I'm also very critical and very open and very honest about history. When it comes to uh, theology and jurisprudence, it's not in my business. I just follow what we are taught. Uh, I don't seek to make uh, kind of logical arguments. When it comes to history, I'm very, very direct and very scientific about the methods that I employ. So I don't take shortcuts. However, as I said before, there is a narrative manipulation that happens in some of the books that are published, especially in the English language and French languages, uh, in the non-Arabic languages. I'm going to demonstrate to you one example of that connected to Ahlul Bayt. Connected to Ahlul Bayt. As I said before, the, the proximity, especially in certain schools of thought in Sunni Islam, to Ahlul Bayt is a threat. It's a threatening agent. It's a threatening component to certain political governments, certain schools of thought. It's threatening. So they, they sanitize the text of these mentions. When you were listening to this lecture... I just showed you the video. They were always saying Imam alayhi salam. The Imams alayhi salam. Okay. Hussein alayhi salam. Naturally, for those of us who are born 
in the Western world and who only have access to translation, the summaries of classical texts, we're going to find that strange. Why would a person say, alayhi salam? He's not even a prophet. Al Hassan is not, is not a prophet. Al Hussein is not a prophet. We say, radiallahu anhum. We don't say, alayhi salam. This is Shia deviance. The reality is, you are what you consume. The knowledge that you can employ and deploy can only be as good as the information where you got the source from which you got the information from. And so for those of us who are brought up into Islam through a specific strand of publications and information, we cannot, we're not capable of going beyond the limit set for us. It's a preset limit for you. You cannot circumvent that without further reading. It's, it's impossible. It's impossible. So for example, if you only read Sahih Bukhari, the very popular English translation, there are many things you will never know. When you hear somebody say Imam um, uh, Hussein, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, your reaction will always be, this is Shia propaganda. What do you mean Imam Hussein alayhi salam? This is not part of Islam. This is exaggeration. But if you open the original books or the books that have not been tampered with, I'm going to be very harsh here, the Arabic, not summarized, not interpreted, not translated, the original Arabic with the full nutrients, you're going to find Imam Ali alayhi salam, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, Fatima alayhi salam in Sahih Bukhari on the text. Now, why is that removed from what you receive as a consumer? It's because, again, there's a risk that if you get used to these sort of terminologies, you may kind of think of, well, alayhi salam, alayhi salam, maybe the Shia have something to say that we may want to listen to. It causes a risk in the narrative. So they remove everything. They remove everything, okay? And I'm going to demonstrate that for you. I'm going to take two copies of the most famous. So you have Sahih Bukhari, the very famous one, Darul Salam. Uh, and then Sahih Bukhari, which is uh, Daru Ibn Kathir, which is published in Beirut and also in uh, Damascus. That's the one you want. <laughs> if you want the full nutrient-based hadith summary, that's the one you want to look at. The summary version, it comes with warning signs, okay? So if you look... Mukhtasar Sahih al-Bukhari. Mukhtasar is an abridgment. It means in this copy of in this collection, we're not going to give you all the hadith. We're going to give you some of them. Why is this important in what I'm saying? Because the historical narrative, in the same way that can also be shaped and limited, so too can other texts connected to that historical narrative can also be shaped and limited. Right? So we're going to take an example here, Sahih Bukhari. Uh, here, you have three problems already. Right? The first problem is, this is a translation. So you are already limited. From the very beginning, you're limited. Isn't, you already, it's a straight jacket situation. A translation means you can only get to the meanings that the author chooses to give you. You don't have the opportunity to look at the real meaning of words. You are already straight jacketed from that beginning. But on top of that is a translation of not the text, but the meanings of the text. A ta'wil, a translation of a ta'wil, a translation of an interpretation, not the literal text, but in the interpretation of a summarized version, subhanAllah. Like if, I'm, I'm always astonished and baffled that you could spend your entire life discussing, arguing about sunnah and hadith, and you've never gone to the original source of the sunnah and hadith. And you've only ever read the Arabic, for example, the, the, the English translation of the meaning of a summarized edition, which means there is, a, there, is a, there is an amount of text that's been removed from the beginning. Not even translated, just removed. And that which is remained, remains in the text is only interpretation and translation. So in that process, a lot of key information is taken out. Right? One of them being how we speak of Ahlul Bayt. One of them being how we speak of Ahlul Bayt. If you're only used to reading the English translation, the summarized, uh, the whitewashed edition, you will never come across a hadith ever that says Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Never. Yeah. However, in the original, the full text with nothing being removed, you will find those hadith and those terminologies. And it's very important. Why? Because we want to have a full perspective. We don't want to be blinded and limited and conditioned. We want to have the full perspective so we can be more aware and informed and also tolerant. 
Okay. So Sahih Bukhari, there is a book on Al Khums. This is all very political. <laughs> Al Khums was a fifth of the booty. So if the Muslims went to war, one fifth, 20%, goes to Rasulullah and his family, Ahl al Bayt. And this was a. I won't get into that now. But I could have the hadith about Fard al Khums. In other words, the obligation of al Khums is in Sahih Bukhari. It's an obligation upon the Muslims to give one fifth of that booty to Ahl al Bayt. So in that chapter, in the original, you will find the narrations coming from very key Sahaba, where you'll find Al, al Hussein and Hussein ibn Ali alayhim as salam. Hussein ibn Ali alayhim as salam. This is the first hadith in that bab. It talks about Hussein and Ali alayhim as salam. Both of them alayhim as salam. The second hadith, right after that, the second hadith, talks about Fatima and Fatima alayhim as salam. So this is in the text, in the Sunni tradition, where you could find these terms being employed. Now the reason why, if you look at the English edition, both of these are hadith are removed. You don't even find the hadith at all. You just skip to another hadith. It's not even translated, it's just removed altogether. It's because of the risk associated with familiarizing the, the reader with these terms. Because they can then turn around and say, well actually, we should be saying Imam Ali, alayhi salam. We should say Fatima, alayhi salam. We should say Imam uh, Hussein alayhi salam that opens a door that may not be easy to close later on so effectively you're being served a version of history that effectively has already been cherry picked and selected for you we then find that this issue predates the modern era this issue of not giving salam not sending salawat upon Ahl al-Bayt predates us it's not a modern phenomenon it happened before as I said before the Abbasid had an issue with this because it could create a certain conflict of interest so we find in the lifetime of uh, Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah, he writes poetry in praise of Ahl al-Bayt. And two of his most distinct uh, prose in praise of them is the following. If love of Muhammad's family, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ahl al-Bayt, is indicative of being a Rafidi, let the whole world know that I am a Rafidi. Because he would say, alayhi salam, alayhi salam. Some people consider that being a Shia. He said, if that's the case, I am a Shia. I'm a Rafidi. Then he goes on to say, Man lam yusalli alaykum la salata lahu. Ya ahl al-bayt, whoever doesn't send salat upon you has no prayer. His salat is batil. What does he mean by this? Some people would say, don't say alayhi salam for Ali. Don't say alayhi salam for Fatima. Don't say alayhi salam for... Uh, just say radiallahu anhum. As Shafi'i says, no. Because when you make the shahud, you say, As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi. Uh, and then you say, upon the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's wa'ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Wa'ali Muhammad is fard, is wajib in every salah. So he says, if you, don't, if you don't like saying that, know that your salah will be incomplete because you have to say it in every salah. Uh, why am I saying this? I'm demonstrating the fact that it is very possible that historical narrative can be twisted to fit a political agenda, and a specific agenda, is very pro and we see it, we've seen it from the beginning, and we see it today. So you have to be somebody who can look beyond what's presented to you and say, is there something behind this? Right? Why is it a problem to say alayhi salam? Because that's legitimacy. That lineage of the Imams from Ahl al-Bayt is, 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 is a threat for the authorities at the time, Banu Abbas and the Umayyads. So they wanted to limit that. And you find people such as Imam uh, al-Shafi insisted on that. So Imam al-Shafi, had he been alive today, he would not say Ali radiallahu anhu. He would say Imam Ali alayhi salam. And you would call him a Rafidi. And he says, I don't care. I am then a Rafidi. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. It works me up because oftentimes we are so quick to argue and debate and put people down. I haven't done the homework. I haven't done the homework. There's so much information out of there. You may not have even touched 1% of the information available, but we want to argue and debate. So that's the historical background around that. And the books that we find in translation would remove these references altogether. Altogether. You just won't find it. In fact, there's a very famous website where I did try to go on just to verify again, just to kind of be fair. And it's not even the website's there. 
even the website is not, it doesn't mention these are hadith, it just removes them altogether. Why? Because it mentions two key issues that are very critical. The issue of homes for Ahl al-Bayt and also the garden. These are very topical issues that the, the Shia hold on to. The garden that was due for Ahl al-Bayt and al-Khums, Fadak. That chapter talks about the, uh, the obligation of paying these things. And it mentions in those terms from the riwayah of, uh, of Aisha radiallahu anha and Abdullah ibn Zubair. From their riwayat, this comes. Was it Orwa ibn Zubair? Sorry. So these are very strong authorities and they themselves talk of Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salam alayhi salam. Very powerful information. So again, when you look at information, keep in mind that you may not be touching even 10% of the information, especially if you're going through translations and abridged editions and revised meanings and so on and so forth, modernization. You will not even touch the essential core base because they don't want you to touch it. That's a reality. Uh, but we learn to live with that because obviously uh, we live in a world where there are varying, various uh, conflicting, competing interests. And at times it's been done before. It's going to be done until the end of time. We put forward the version of history that suits our agenda. That's it. And the rest is up to the reader to basically figure it out for themselves. Welcome to History Yoon, the world's leading online learning platform specializing in Islamic history. Discover the History Yoon mobile app and participate in regular live and interactive seminars and tune in directly from your handset from anywhere in the world. Enjoy instant access to a growing catalog of on-demand streaming content exclusive to the platform, accessible from a variety of devices including desktops, tablets, and cell phones. Connect instantly with our global community of history enthusiasts via our private community forum. To find out more about our online history programs and resources, visit our website today at www.historyyoon.com.